afternoon, ladies and gents. Thank you very much for joining us for this BPF and CREFC webinar. My name is David Hatcher and I'm one of the editorial directors of Re React News and I will be your chair for today. Uh, it's a new format to me and for some of the other, other panellists, so uh, I'm sure plenty of you as well. So please do bear with us. Hopefully there won't be any tech issues and things will run smoothly. Um, it's the first in a series of great events that the BPF uh, and Cressy are doing and planning on tech, global insights and politics. So please do keep a close eye on their upcoming schedules. Um, we have quite an enormous topic to try and cover over the next 45 minutes and as far as the outlook for real estate finance. Uh, but we, we shall try and cover the most important and meaty issues uh, the best way we can. Thankfully, we've got a superb host of experts to enlighten us on the uh, complex issues that the sector is facing at the moment. We have Jessica Tomlinson, who's uh, Head of Real Estate London at Bar Barclays, Peter Cosmetatos, uh, Chief Executive of Cressy Europe, Jan Fletcher, Director of Policy Finance at the BPF, and last by no means least, uh, Lorna Brown, Head of Capital Markets at Delancey. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon, guys. Um, inevitably, there's only going to be one overarching topic, really, that's going to impact our discussion. Uh, so, so let's kick off by, by asking, what are lenders occupied with right now from a practical perspective? Is it purely a case of getting arms around uh, the existing book and working out positions, Jessica? Good afternoon, everyone. So I think our key focus at Barclays is, I would sum up as being ready to support clients and supporting clients. So clearly we have a very diverse lending book encapsulating development lending, investment lending, as well as corporate lines to listed customers and house builders. So our central strategy at the moment is to provide the support that businesses need so they can kind of cope with the absolute eye of the storm. And also so that management teams have the breathing space they need to spend their time with tenants and occupiers working through what they think impacts are going to be on cash flow, at least in the immediate period, and kind of forecasting and preparing themselves for what's next. So what that's really meant for us is our central strategy has been to provide covenant waivers and resets and where necessary capital repayment holidays for clients. We're also acutely aware that people need answers at speed because management teams need to know that they've got the comfort of knowing where they are on their banking covenants in order to be able to do what they need to do to manage their businesses. Yeah. So what that's meant for us over the last four weeks with our you know, 120 or so people in real estate transitioning to working fully from home is to relook at our processes and procedures to enable us to react at speed. And I'm frankly really proud by the work the team have done to be able to do that. So we are being able to give answers to clients very quickly um, and you know, allow them to move on with things. Um, I think the current payment cycle we're right in the heart of now, I think the impact actually has been relatively low in terms of the percentage of customers requiring support for this cycle. However, conversations with our kind of 700 clients in real estate certainly in, it suggests that there'll be a much bigger requirement for the next payment cycle. So we're gearing up for that. So that's kind of one key part of strategy. The other point is, as we are an accredited lender for both the business interruptions loans and the larger business interruption loans, we've been spending an awful lot of time making sure that as a bank, we're ready to deploy those lending schemes and understanding the detail of those so we can talk to clients about how they can source liquidity and what their options are. So supporting clients very carefully through that and you know, just on Monday, we launched the larger business loans. So to date, demand for those types of products in real estate, I think is gonna be confined much more to kind of clients with corporate lines and house builders. And I suspect that our investment clients' main need will be the covenant waivers, capital repayment holiday type elements. But it's really important that we understand the full picture of support available so that we can help clients navigate it. So I would say, you know, our key focus as a business has been supporting clients through this eye of the storm. I think it's too early to kind of start to tackle what the long-term impacts need to be. And that would be the wrong thing to do because you know, clients can't afford to be bogged down right now. So it's about what do they need for the next you know, six months? And then you know, we will keep the dialogue going as we progress through. Peter, do you think that's sort of broadly reflective of where your members are in terms of 
getting their arms around their lending books and where their um, where their positions are, or do you think more broadly there's a bit more of a still a state of flux in terms of even trying to trying to assess things? No, I, th I think the picture that Jess paints is is pretty consistent with what I hear from from most lenders. I guess there's a big difference between the the huge volume teams uh, like Barclays have and the much wider range of firms, many of which will have much smaller platforms or have much more of their functions outsourced. Um, so we've been talking both to um, the loan servicing platforms that act as facility agents for a lot of loans and who will be seeing a lot of, who will be collecting a lot of the information from borrowers and will be engaging in a lot of the conversations about what happens where there are covenant uh, waivers that are needed and, and what level of stress there is in the market as well as um, a range of lenders. I think I think with the exception of some of the more opportunistically minded who are already busy looking for lending opportunities, um, I think undoubtedly new lending has has pretty much stopped. There was a there was a load of loans that were very much in the works that didn't stop that have been completed sometimes with a bit of modification, not necessarily so. Um, but I think overwhelmingly people are very much focused on the immediate, you know, have been over the last few weeks, over the immediate short term of dealing with the interest payment dates in April, which is, I think, is kind of still in process, really, um, that followed the March uh, payment date. I'm not sure that people have really looked ahead uh, very easily or have really had the chance to um, to think about what the overall impact on their books is going to be and what we look like when we come out the other side we still don't know how far how far away that is or what what the world looks like when that happens so i think it's, it is very much responding to um borrowers that need help need information need to have discussions about how they how they get through this quarter and the next one of course uh, lorna I, I guess to some extent you only see it from from one position but how, to what extent um, have your conversations uh, with lenders been like in terms of tone and, and, and what they've addressed? And have you picked up anything sort of from your from your peers as well, perhaps? Yeah, I, I think, um, as you'd say, we, I'm obviously now sitting on the borrower side, but did spend a rather extensive amount of time uh, sitting on the other side of the table as the lender. So sort of drawing experience from both of those parts, I think. The speed and shock of what happened in terms of the lifestyle impact, the health impact, all of those points for, for, for people globally is not missed by anybody who is um, who's listening to this uh, this webinar or who's um, who's involved. But I think the biggest point that I would draw is I think we took comfort from the sort of early lead of the regulator this time in terms of coming out and talking to uh, providing guidance to the lenders that actually. Um, this is not a, a, a sort of by design flaw. Uh, there's no blame here. The better position is to allow flexibility without um, having adverse capital impacts uh, and to encouraging proactive engagement with borrowers. And, and that's what we are seeing across the board from uh, the lenders that we work with. We have um, sort of long term relationships. I think um, a lot of what the Delancey do has been built over uh, a long-term uh, interest and investment in the sector in real estate generally but overall I think that um, assets that were well positioned prior to coming into this pandemic situation may need to um, have steps and tolerance to get us through the short term but it's also important for us to be thinking how we deal with the immediate issues and then obviously how we plan to come back out of the other side um, and that's sort of where we would uh, anticipate working with our lenders openly, collaboratively, um, sharing information and, and basically sort of describing the situation as it evolves uh, and giving our thoughts on it as we as we move forward. And, and have any of those conversations in your sort of business as usual um, process been around around new lending or is that just not a not a topic on the table at the moment? Well, I think it, it's natural and expected that lenders would want to take stock in terms of their existing book. I think it would, uh, particularly after the, the GFC, that it would be remiss if they didn't. Um, so having their arms around, the book, their, around their own book is the right thing for them to be doing. 
Um, so I think that is a natural and understandable point. But I think certainly from the conversations we've had, it doesn't mean that people have said they are closed to new business. What they have said is, we have a number of relationship clients that we want to deal with. We have to be there and prioritize for them. Of course, we're happy to look at opportunities as they come up, but clearly, I think um, new lending is a function of supply and demand. And if we bring that back to the general investment market, the, uh, the volumes there will be down. So uh, it is a, an area that we hear lenders are open, but if you had to ask for a proportion, the proportion would be on their existing book rather than on uh, on new business at the moment. And, and I, I, I can empathize with that. For sure. I, I think uh, Q2 investment volumes are going to be in pretty interesting. That's that's for sure. But um, but Jessica, if you've if you've got somebody coming to you with a with a new opportunity, particularly if they're an existing client, you know, is there capacity to be having that conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a few things. If I just touch on um, a couple of things that Lorna said actually around that, and I think if we just take the tone of discussions first, I think those words openness, collaboration, and relationship are absolutely critical. Um, and Lorna talked about you know, the dialogue and kind of keeping in touch with clients, with, with lenders as the situation evolves. And I think that is a really key focus that um, collaboration and discussion has to be open and ongoing because this is a rapidly um, developing situation. On the topic of new lending, I mean, there certainly will continue to be appetite to lend, but clearly from a kind of time and resource perspective, the central focus is on supporting clients that need help now. Um, but, but we have completed on all of the transactions we've kind of given our word on and are continuing to look at things for clients. I mean, clearly there are some very simple practical challenges around um, lending now. This is a volatile time in which to be underwriting transactions and that will have an implication on terms and on risk premium. But clearly, you know, we are there to support our clients and, and that will include you know, requests for new liquidity. And, and by that, in, in simple terms, we're expecting to see higher margins and, and lower LTVs offered, I presume. Well, I think it will depend on the asset, the client uh, and the transaction. But I think uh, you know, it, it, you know, if you look at what's happened in the public debt market, your know, upward pressure on pricing is obvious. Yeah, yeah. P Peter, I, I, guess, I guess as Jessica points out, we're, we're already seeing a, a hike, in, hike in pricing. To, to what extent do you think that's going to sort of c continue and, and maybe, maybe stimmy transactions? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely been... Uh, I can't remember the numbers, but I've already heard about, um, we, we, we've seen it in the CMBS market, for example, how um, the spreads for different uh, different tranches of debt have, have moved out and pricing undoubtedly in the loan market, um, will, it will be shifting. Um, I, I think the appetite for new lending and the performance of existing books and uh, government policy are all going to be factors that affect um, how much volume and how much what price is attached to new lending over the coming months i think the the point that just makes about just the practical challenges around new lending you know the fact that you can't go on site you know was party to an exchange of emails yesterday where someone was saying if we could borrow that those other guys drone so that we can go and look at the building then we'd be very interested in lending against it you know it, it, it's a really difficult environment at the moment and my sense and i think this probably reflects what i've heard from the investment side as well is that um it, there's a very natural period now to pause and focus on what you've already got and make sure that you understand what you have. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I, yeah, I, 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 I don't think there's anything, there's anything dramatic yet, but I think it, it's, it's, it's obvious in what direction pricing and, and availability of credit will move. I think sure. just to, to add to that, I would obviously say there's a couple of points to think about the pricing, pricing discovery at the moment is difficult. Um, just because of where people are, Jess quite rightly referenced the public markets and their volatility. The private markets tend to A, lag that, but B, be relatively more stable because they are, uh, by their very nature, less liquid. Um, but I think that one of the things that I would say that we would point out towards is that this probably endorses the fact that interest rates are expected to remain low. Um, and I think that uh, that might in itself bring some inflationary pressures, but if you put that to the side for a moment, um, what it does also suggest is that the return of QE, which in itself had an impact on keep bringing bond pricing down. 
And I think that the reality is it's probably just a bit too soon to draw the conclusion that it means that pricing will move dramatically up. I think there will be restrict a bit of restricted supply at this very time. But I think as we all adjust to the new norm, pretty much like we're doing by having this webinar, <laughs> instead of sitting in a live format, things will change, it will evolve, uh, and we'll come back to that point. But I do think there were some interesting points about pricing generally in the CAS survey yesterday, uh, and where pricing had been relative to the 10-year norm. And it was sort of pointing out that actually, most sectors were broadly in line with it. Some were a little below, some were a little above. Uh, retail probably being above, um, offices maybe being a little bit below. But I think that 10 year average is an important point to draw us back towards. And when you look at that combined with um, the low interest rate situation, I think it, it, it hopefully um, points towards stability in that sector. Well, yeah, one, thing I, one thing I'd say, sorry to interrupt there, but it's just please. that it, it, it's, it's obvious that we're going to draw certain comparisons with the GFC. But I think one thing to remember is that the market coming into this crisis was in a totally different place. We have not been in a period of terrible overheating, of huge overlending, of exuberance, of any of that. Leverage levels are sensible. Bank capital is in a relatively strong place. The, the, you know, as, as the CAS data shows, the volumes of lending and the distribution around where capital is coming from in the lending market have all been relatively stable for the last four, five, six years. So it, it, it's a, you know, I couldn't, one couldn't hope for a more stable and sensible and healthy market to come into a crisis like this. That doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to navigate, but just the starting point is a, is a good one, not one that contained the seeds for the crisis that is following, as it were, which is what we had in the GFC. And, and although forbearance, uh, um, sorry, although sort of impaired loans went up uh, dramatically as a percentage in, in gross terms, they were still, still pretty low. Mm -hmm. In, in terms of the CAS survey, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so all that given, does that um, give you hope that we won't end up in a, again, going back to comparison with GFC, that, does that give you hope that we won't see losses or impairments to the point that um, banks' balance sheets are broken and we don't see a mass credit crunch situation? Um, it gives me a bit of hope. It doesn't, I, I don't think we're in a safe place for that because how the economy is going to perform and how well ordinary businesses and economic activity will be able to cope with what could prove a really quite prolonged period of mandated economic uh, inactivity um, is anybody's guess. Um, and and it's, it's difficult to feel very optimistic. I think I, I tend to be more on the bearish side. Uh, in terms of you know how long it will be before we can return to normal or anything that resembles normal in terms of levels of economic activity, not necessarily the way that we were doing things and um, I think one thing that the government was clear about from the beginning and that and that it feels feels intuitive is that the longer the period uh, of the pause, um, the more the danger is that you 're going to lose businesses that could be there to to restart at the end of it so if it were only a quarter, maybe two quarters, and then everything can kind of ramp up again quickly. Um, you know, the, the job retention, the furlough, furloughed staff scheme, the business rate breaks, the business continuity loans, all the business interruption loans, all of that stuff should be good to tide everyone through so that we come through the other side and then people are able to catch up uh, and, and economic activity can continue and the credit impact for lenders should be, should be manageable. Um, if we end up facing, you know, a year or more of very significantly dampened economic activity, I think it's, it's much harder, it's much harder to imagine how you come through that without an awful lot of credit loss. Um, and that, you know, and that isn't the fault of anybody. It's just the, the reality that could flow from that level of, um, that level of prolonged economic lockdown. So I, I don't think we can be too sanguine about how things look, despite the healthy starting point that we've come into this uh, with. Absolutely. Je Jessica, does, do you have similar con concerns? I know it's a little bit crystal ball gazing, but you know that we could end up with a, with a credit crunch in you know, six months time or, or however long. Oh, I think, I think you know, Peter's points at the top of that were you know, the key ones here, which is we are going into this crisis um, with banks in a 
they're in different positions from a capital perspective than they were back at the start of the GFC. I think the other key, key point here for the real estate market is the real estate market is now significantly more diversified. And I think that will be a key point in terms of sources of capital down the line. I think you know, different business models will be exposed to different kinds of pressures at different times, and it will be interesting to see how that plays out. But clearly, uh, it is the depth and length of the crisis which will determine the level of risk around you know, certain lenders you know, struggling from a, from a credit availability perspective. But, uh, but I, you know, you know, I don't think that's an issue that we're facing it now in any way. John, I want to want to bring you in, in in just a second. Apologies, I haven't been ignoring you. I, I promise. Um, just sort of one, one question to extrapolate that topic. Um, again, referencing the uh, the CAS survey again, uh, which highlights that there's uh, 43 billion of loans uh, to mature in the UK, uh, secured against commercial real estate in the next two years. Um, given that uh, discussion we've we've just had, how how difficult do you think that it might be to to refinance those? those loans, Lorna? Well, I think it's interesting to put it in context because clearly at the moment, no one will deny that that sounds like a very large number. But if you look back through the data, the annual origination volumes in the UK market have been between 40 and 48 billion consistently for the last five years. So the number that you're talking about in terms of the, uh, the due for refinancing in the next two years actually only re represents 50% of the annualized volume. Um, and I think that's an important context for people to consider that number in. Um, clearly that would have been come from, some would come from sales, some would come from refinancing. And I think a lot of that will be driven by the ultimate capital that's behind it. What is their requirements? What do they need to do? But I do think that in a normalized market that wouldn't present a challenge. Um, and I think that's the question for all of us here. And I think unfortunately we don't have the answer to it in terms of when do we return to a normalized market? Uh, but certainly, I think there would be a lot of people that would be hopeful it would be within the two-year period, um, and that may well absorb it. But, but look, there may well be sectorial differences. There may well be um, different challenges for different sectors, hospitality, retail, other parts. There, they, they, it will not be a uniform approach, and uh, you would probably need to be underneath um, those numbers to understand a little bit set, better the sector bias and where they sit. But I think, as Jess said, Capital has come from many different places in recent years, um, different appetites, dif different risk attachments. What may happen is that debt has to be refinanced at more expensive pricing. Debt has to be refinanced with more equity coming in. So there will be, I think, different ways that it can be worked through. But I think that if the property fundamentals hold good, um, and it's particularly um, one of the interesting parts from CAS for me was just the predominance of central London, for example, as one of the areas, I think the, the endurance of that location is well established. So I, I think um, there's an expectation that lenders and borrowers will work together to come through that. But if we, um, I wouldn't see those numbers as out of kilter um, with the sorts of volumes that you've seen, even as we went through the GFC, those numbers were being absorbed. Jan, let's uh, let's start with you. Apologies for uh, for diverting things elsewhere. Um, we we've started to hear um, more and more about your proposals and the proposals of of other uh, groups who've been working with on the furloughed space grant scheme. Can you just tell us a bit more for for those who aren't uh, entirely familiar uh, with about the proposals, how you see them working, um, and I guess just just how crucial uh, in your mind it is that something like this is introduced in terms of the, the sustainability of the, of the real estate industry and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the finance uh, side of it that supports it. Sure, thanks. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that, that it's crucial enough that it's got landlords and retailers agreeing on something, which isn't you know, it's not something you see every day. Uh, but, but more generally, I mean, we recognize and, and we welcome, obviously, all of the support that government's uh, provided so far, you know, the, the uh, furloughing schemes, the um, business rates holidays, all of the stuff that Peter's already mentioned will undoubtedly save a lot of jobs. 
Um, but we think there's a, perhaps a bit of a gap when it comes to support with property occupation costs and certainly the feedback we're having from some of the bodies that we're talking to on the occupier side. So the retail consortium, um, you know, the, the, the beer and pubs, uh, UK hospitality, etc. cetera. Um, it, 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 there's, there's certainly a feeling that without further, some form of further government intervention, um, then otherwise viable businesses are just not going to make it through the next few months because there is just no income coming through. Um, it, you know, it, it goes from being a liquidity issue where there is no cash to being a solvency issue where there's no value. So um, our proposal for, for those who haven't heard about it is based on the approach that Denmark is taking. So the government there has committed to covering up to 80% of the fixed costs uh, of, of businesses. Um, they've not restricted it in, in any way to particular sectors, but there is a cap on how much relief individual businesses can get. Um, and the, the amount of relief, uh, the, the, the proportion of fixed costs that the government covers uh, it sort of depends on, on how badly they've been affected by the coronavirus crisis. But I mean, I think more important than exactly how the mechanics work and, and what the scheme looks like in practice is just certain principles that I think um, we would want any further government intervention in this area to cover. So, you know, any any scheme along these lines would have to complement existing schemes. And, and I guess most relevantly here at C-bills and, and syllables um, and CCFF. You know, uh, I think I think something we'll need to be able to persuade government of if they are to introduce something along these lines is that those schemes aren't aren't doing uh, what they what they're sh what they're supposed to be doing or what government intended them to do. I think any scheme also needs to recognise that property is a really complex ecosystem. It's not just a case of of passing you know helping one uh, bit of the chain without doing anything for for the rest because in in that way you just end up with uh, with problems being shunted down the line. And, and any scheme also needs to incentivize landlords and occupiers and lenders to be working together and collaboratively. You know, it should, to, any, to the extent possible, kind of minimize the confrontation in, in the system and the incentives for that. And then perhaps most importantly of all, given uh, the, the, uh, the challenges that some occupier businesses are facing, it needs to get, out, get the cash out quickly. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think of those that the sharing the point that sharing the pain part is critical um it, you know we're not expecting the government to hold every you know to make whole every occupier every every etc um, but what we're trying to do with a scheme is keep the money flowing through the system um so that any pain can be kind of managed and 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 dealt with in a uh, controlled and uh, well as far as possible um controlled and and, and sort of sympathetic way do you, do you think that if um, you know, you talk about uh, occupiers falling into distress if this isn't, uh, this or something uh, similar isn't put in place. Do you envisage that if it isn't that you might see sort of widespread distress within in the real estate community and, and large scale insolvencies of, of property companies? So that's a difficult one to answer because, uh, as has already been alluded to, different sectors are feeling this in different ways. Um, so, so, you know, the currently the the most acute distress has been felt in those consumer facing uh industries like hospitality like leisure like retail and depending on where we get to in terms of opening up and going back to normal um it's possible that for at least some of those sectors you know actually actually things things may be okay um it, it is just the case as peter has said of tiding us over for the next six months or so and 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 the current government schemes are enough to do that however you know the the gyms and other other hospitality venues have already been told that they're last in line, um, and they're thinking, well, this could last for another twelve months or so. And actually, even once we open up again, things aren't going to be quite normal because we're going to have to maintain social distancing, and therefore there's not going to be the same amount of revenue coming through the door. And therefore, how are we going to meet our fixed costs? I think I think that's really where where the big question is, and and I think. Um, what what the government really needs to think about is um, you know, does it does it want to sort of let the market do it, its thing and, and and sort of allow businesses to fail and somehow support the individuals uh, affected through this? Um, do they you know is is it better that uh, the taxpayer intervenes and and sort of we socialise the losses in some way? And you know, what are the ne negative externalities of a glut of insolvencies potentially in certain parts of the economy? What are the knock-on impacts of that you know socially and economically? So 
yeah, it's it's tricky. Um, it's tricky, but but obviously, as Peter has said, the longer this goes on for, the more likely one of those scenarios becomes. I think, I think it's really it's really Thanks. important to avoid a, to my mind, a very widespread and acute um, collapse of businesses in a in a narrow space of time. Um, I think there are two reasons for that. And it's not really about landlords. I don't think it matters that deeply if landlords fail, because when landlords fail, it's principally an opportunity for assets to reprice. I think that's kind of what, what happens. But what really matters is the operational businesses at one end. If they lose their space, if they go bust, if they fail, they will be harder to revitalize and they won't be the businesses either to conduct the economic activity that we all depend on as a society in the first place or to pay the rent, right, that feeds the rest of the system. And secondly, at the other end of the spectrum, if you do have very widespread over quite a concentrated period pain that is stopping the rental flows from coming through to landlords and that is therefore impacting the credit in the banking system and in, in the lending market and indeed in the wider investment industry, I think you've potentially got quite a big problem in terms of what that does to the appetite of capital, the availability of capital and the cost of capital in this sector. Um, including potentially beyond this sector, because as we've seen in the GFC, if you do end up exposing the financial system to very significant pain, even from something quite specific like commercial property, that can end up infecting, um, infecting the financial system more widely. So I think, I think those are good reasons for trying to at least spread the pain and try and ensure that the pain is shared in the ways that um, the, the, the principles that Jan was outlining uh, would, would seek to achieve. Um, whilst uh, Jan and Peter, I, I appreciate that neither of you are the Chancellor of the Exchequer as, as much as we'd all probably uh, like that to be the case. Um, but to what extent do you sort of have a, have a feeling in your waters or from the interactions that you've had that there's going to be some progress on this? You know, is this you know, something that people are, are listening to and it's getting traction or is it just sort of something you guys are having to shout about and hope, hope sort of sticks? I'd, I'd, I'd answer that uh, by saying both. Um, so we we are getting traction. We've been, you know, we we know that this has landed at the Treasury. And, and interestingly enough, this morning, um, Lord Allen of Kensington tabled a written question to the government, asking them what consideration they've given of our particular scheme. So the government's going to have to at least provide a response to that. Um, you know, less formally, we've been talking to officials in a range of departments over the last you know, three or four weeks while this has all been unfolding. And they, they know, um, you know, they know about the huge rent and service charge shortfall. They know that property owners are in a difficult position. They know that we're expecting June to be as difficult, if not more difficult than uh, March quarter. And they're thinking about what, what package of support might be necessary for, for property owners ahead of the June quarter date um, so, so so yes I, I'm, I'm confident that we'll get some sort of traction whether we'll end up with the government implementing our scheme as proposed I, I don't know but I think I think it's almost more important that we're having the conversation and that something gets done rather than specifically that thing so if it's a case of tweaking existing support packages so that they achieve the same objective yeah why not one big one big challenge is that um, real estate as a, as a sort of ecosystem is intercon interconnects so many really quite different parts of the economy. So the departments in government that have an interest in influence over, control over, a stake in different elements that all fit together for all of this is quite wide. So you've got MHCLG, Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, which are the, the main department that looks after commercial real estate. You've got the business department, which is interested in the occupiers. You've got the Treasury, which obviously holds the purse strings. You've got the Bank of England and PRA, who are very interested in the macro prudential financial stability aspects. You've got the FCA that's interested in how people are treating their customers. All of these departments aren't necessarily used to talking to each other very regularly and developing proposals for dealing with things in extremely short order. So, and, and while government departments is, 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 is relatively okay, when you're trying to bring in the financial regulatory side, I think that really does tend to be a little bit separate. So I'd agree with everything Jan said. I just think part of the challenge isn't, you know, whether we can get tra tra traction which, with particular teams that have a particular focus in the market that we're focusing on. It's whether you can try and get all the other dots joined up within government so that people understand that actually if this isn't happening over here, then there could be consequences over there. 
that people might not have anticipated. Um, I've just got a couple of quick questions before we move on to questions uh, from the audience which have been coming in. Please do uh, keep chucking them our way. Um, talking of um, sort of regulator intervention, uh, Peter, how, how likely do you think it, it might be uh, that we see the, the FCA uh, come in and, and formalise that um, request to not be naughty boys and girls and, and treat, uh, treat borrowers nicely? Um, so I don't know whether, yeah, I don't know which department you'd be talking to about this, whether you're talking about the FCA or whether it's, um, Giving other them. government department. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, at the moment, my sense is that there's very thin data for anyone to really work with. It's only anecdote so far about how different constituencies in the market are behaving. So we hear this in the, in the real estate side with, you know, tenants, uh letting off a lot of hot air about how well tenants complaining about how some landlords are treating them uh equally we've heard from some landlords about how some tenants have been trying it on um i suspect that there will be similar discussions to some degree between landlords and their lenders where again i think i think i think the right way to do things is exactly what um, Jess and Lorna talked about earlier, which is people need to be communicative, people need to be transparent, people need to engage and be constructive. Um, we're all kind of all in the same boat at the end of the day. There will be a sharing of pain that's required at some level, um, hopefully not all quickly. Um, but I, to me, it seems premature, and I think it would be premature for regulators to step in and, as it were, take the side of one constituency against another and say that, you know, this lot are behaving badly and shouldn't be allowed to do X, Y, and Z. And I think actually even just the evictions moratorium that kicked off the whole policy intervention for our sector with all of this, you can understand what drove it, but it's not necessarily the most helpful thing because it, it, it kind of drives a wedge between different constituencies. It intervenes in existing contractual relationships in a way that overrides and perhaps disincentivizes the dialogue that is the better way forward. Yes, yeah, and I'd, I'd just add there, David, sorry, sorry um, if, if, if the government could do more to support flows of payment through through the chain, um, it would, I think, help, uh, it would empower everybody involved to have those more kind of constructive and, and supportive discussions rather than feeling that financial pressures are backing them into a particular corner. Jessica, presumably something, uh, something like that in terms of government intervention wouldn't, wouldn't be particularly welcome from your end. So I think it's not a question really of whether it's welcome or not. I would hope that it isn't required. You know, I would hope that, that, that you know, lenders and borrowers will be having the constructive dialogue that, that is needed to get through the, to get, get through this period of time. Um, and as Peter says, you know, it, it, data is a question here. You know, my sense um, anecdotally is that lenders are having the right conversations, not just us, but others, but we do, we are working in a diversified market and not everybody's structures will necessarily allow them to be as accommodators. And so I think we're going to have to see how it plays out. But my expectation would be that lenders and borrowers should work together and, and, and be able to figure out, figure a way through. Although again, um, just to, to, to Jan's point about how if more cash is coming through the system, that makes it a lot easier. I think that's absolutely true because not every lender is going to be in the position of a bank with the relatively flexible funding structure that a bank has and the ability to show more flexibility. There are, there are fund, debt funds and others, other lenders for whom there's, there's quite a clear matching that needs to happen between the income generated by the loans that they've made and a liability profile they need to be able to match. And if you're funded in the capital markets or you've got you know, annuity payments to make or whatever else it might be, um, you don't necessarily, you're, you're not necessarily being met with flexibility from your funders that allows you to replicate that when you're dealing with your borrowers. So something needs to happen to kind of make sure that the show doesn't just fall off the rails, that the train doesn't fall off the rails um, in June in particular, I think. You know, we, we just yeah. need to spread this out a little bit and allow a bit more fat in the system to keep things going and encourage discussion and engagement. Well, that was the last thing that I wanted to pick up on, which was, um, you know, the next quarter date, what happens? Um, I appreciate that's, that's quite, a, quite a big question. Uh, Lorna, any thoughts on, on sort of 
how you see that that period in and around and, and after quarter date evolving? I, I think that's the answer we're all probably looking for because it's so intrinsically linked to the lockdown and the timing. I think what is interesting is the adaptation you're starting to see across the board. Um, we, we, we're seeing retailers who previously had zero internet sales very quickly creating and developing internet platforms and so I think as we go through the next quarter I expect that there will be a change in terms of the adaptation of people in terms of how we adapt and cope particularly if the period will be longer uh, that we are enforcing social distancing even if we're not locked down for for, for as long period. I think it, it, it's undeniably right that there will be challenges and we do need to be able to to be there to work for them but I think it has to be uh, a collaborative and open approach across the board. I think one thing that is interesting is there's always been a lot of um, sort of tension about, for example, trading figures, etc. in retail. That could be an interesting development that comes from this. Would tenants be prepared to share ongoing trading information and, and, and use that as some way of dealing with the deferrals that may have to happen to rent going forward. So I think there's lots of different things that, that could happen. And I think the, the big question really is, what's the timing and what's the sector? Uh, when do we come out of the lockdown and how is that sector particularly influenced? But I do think that it will be important for people to engage op openly and um, that no one is looking to be opportune uh, and, we, and we find a balanced approach through this. Um, as I said, it's not by design. This is not something that people can effectively risk manage. It's how we, uh, how we deal with the situation that we're in, how we adapt and how we plan for the next steps going forward. Anybody else want to come in on, on that in terms of thoughts around how, how cool today is going gonna, is gonna to evolve and unravel? Don't know, shower once. <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's hard, right? It's, it's hard to, to look um, even three, three months into the future. I, I guess I'd just come back to the point that um, we know that for some sectors, this is going to take longer to get back to normal than for others, potentially. Um, it, it will take longer for some businesses to be in a position to be creating enough economic value to support the rents that they signed up to pay. Um, and that if you know, and, and, and that if the government doesn't do anything, then there's a high chance that a number of those won't make it through. So um, it comes back to, to the proposals that we've been uh, discussing and, and putting forwards to them, uh, that, that you know, they, they should be, if they want to, to avoid a big glut of insolvencies, they should be um, stepping in and, and working with us. Fantastic. Um, right, I'd just like to pick up on a question from Rachel Kelly, which says, uh, when lenders talk about an interest payment holiday, what does this mean exactly? Is it generally a complete relief for a period of time, or would that accrued interest need to be repaid at another time? I guess that's a, a question best put to you, Jessica. Um, so at the moment, we're not seeing high demand for interest payment holidays. What we're seeing is demand for covenant waivers, resets, and in some cases, um, some short-term relief around amortisation. I think clearly if we if, if, if there are a stage where uh, there are requests for interest then then the usual process would be that that is you know added to the loan and caught up that would be a normal way of dealing with it but I think that it will very much depend on the situation of, of the business and the client and what the long-term prognosis is for that organization but I don't think that's something that people are seeing at volume yet certainly not something in our space a holiday doesn't have a sort of a, a, a technical sense. It just means you don't have to pay during a particular period. And As we all know, holidays come to an end, unfortunately, don't yeah. they? They don't go on forever. And they're um, still, still there when you come back. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think this will, this will probably be our, our last uh, question for the day because we are rapidly running out of time, uh, which is directed to uh, Peter from Ross Good, which is, uh, with real estate lending so disparate, now compared to GFC, what do you expect to see outside of traditional lenders' uh, behaviours after the next six months? So, yeah, so I, I, I tried to get a clarification from Ros on this one because she says after the next six months, and I'm afraid I just can't see that far into the future. Um, and I wondered whether she meant over the next six months. I think, I think non, non, the, the sort of non-institutional lenders are, are, will be interesting 
because by all accounts, there's plenty of dry powder in the market. There's plenty of capital that's been raised by people. Um, so th there'll be, I think, I think you've got, you know, you can look at it in terms of existing loans and existing books and how people deal with that. And it remains to be seen how flexible different, different non-bank uh, alternative lenders are able to be in dealing with their existing books. That'll depend on the timing of their, of their uh, fund end date. It'll depend on uh, the expectations and, and the discussions that they have with their investors. It'll depend on whether they're leveraged and, and how and how that feeds in. Um, as far as new lending by funds is concerned, I suspect that might be one of the active areas because as soon as we are seeing stress in the wider market and opportunities emerge, um, that's exactly the kind, of, uh, the kind of environment that they can thrive in. And, and we saw that in the years after the, the GFC. Right. I think we've got one or two uh, more coming in that I think we'll just try and whip through as we've got a few more minutes. Um, Martin Munford asks, what steps could be made available to start new lending? The availability of debt is having an impact on liquidity of assets. Is there, is there something that government could do in terms of um, making measures, putting in place measures to sort of force banks to lend or provide liquidity for, especially for new lending? Is, is that something that could be explored? I um, don't know whether Jess or Peter might want to pick up on that. I don't know. I mean, the, you know, certainly for the banking sector, there, there are um, sources of liquidity through the central bank um, that are intended to encourage lending. Um, and and, and I, I'm not especially familiar because it, it wouldn't be real estate specific. It would be the kind of schemes that are put in place to encourage lending. And that would include um, the business interruption stuff uh, for the short term, but but also more more broadly. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there are things the government can do, but I, I think as soon as you start talking about forcing banks to lend, that makes me feel distinctly uncomfortable. <laughs> um, guys, Lorna and Jess, have you, you got a bit more time or have you, have you got, to got to bounce? Okay, all right, marvellous. Well, um, thank you for all your questions, guys. Um, really appreciate it. Hope you've enjoyed um, watching and um, do keep tuned with uh, the BPF and CREFC um, schedule and uh, if you could all conceptually um, or literally uh, clap or applaud wherever you are the, uh, the participants who have uh, kindly kept us engaged and entertained that would be much appreciated. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, enjoyed it. Cheers. Thanks David.